I really talked about uh, maybe four things. One, about the stagnation in the advanced economies and deceleration in the emerging economies. And I think that uh, the, the, the part about stagnation in the advanced economies, my view, I tend to think it's realistic. Some people might think it's pessimistic. I think that actually what we're seeing right now are not the bad days. We, we're going to have challenging, more challenging days in the future. And this has to do simply with the fact that the advanced economies are no longer growing very fast. They have matured and the growth is no longer there. The productivity numbers are going down. And as a result, living standards over time will stagnate. Now, the good news is that even though the emerging economies are deceleration, as well. You can't have export-led growth when advanced economies cannot absorb products and, and services. Nonetheless, they have potential to grow for quite a long time. Even in China, which has been growing with the double digits for quite a long time, that won't happen in the future. But if you are growing, say, 5 to 6 percent a year, that's three to four times faster than the fastest and major advanced economies. Under peaceful, good conditions, it could continue another 5, 15 years. Now, even more pertains to the potential of India. Uh, Brazil and Russia are facing greater problems, uh, Brazil internal, uh, Russia external. But they are not the only BRICS or the mini BRICS or the future BRICS. Yeah, Mexico, Indonesia, and particularly in Asia, you have far more uh, opportunities, I think, than the risks in the long term. That was one part of my presentation. The second part looked more into deglobalization. Until 2008, we all talked about globalization from 1945 to 2008. And Unfortunately, we're now facing a period of not unlike what we saw in 1914-1945. That period ended in a very devastating way. I don't think that we will make the same mistakes today, but we will be facing similar challenges and from a more difficult starting point, meaning that our growth potential is not as good, our productivity potential is not as good, and so on and so forth. Now, we see this in four key areas. We see it in trade, which has been plunging. It's not just a slowdown. It's really has been declining. Uh, international investment is doing better in the sense that it's growing, but it's growing relatively slow and it's still pre-2008 level. Uh, migration, which is vital for labor mobility, is not where it has been in the past and it's stagnating. And unfortunately, the global displacement of, of people, persons, has higher than at any point of time since 1945, 61 million people. This is very dangerous in the long term. Nonetheless, these are all opportunities. If you can turn the trade around, that provides export-led growth. If you can have more investment, and you should, advanced economies, as they invest in emerging economies, create more opportunities for their people and the people in emerging economies, and so on and so forth. So I try to give a positive message and positive implications in a very challenging situation. Third aspect was how do these things relate with uh, shifts in capital, in trade, in, in rather than capital portfolio investments and so on and so forth. So I talked a bit about stock markets. We see record highs in the U.S. We see not so good numbers in China. But um, intriguingly, in the long term, the potential of the Chinese market, I believe, will be far higher than what we see in the U.S. And it's possible that the numbers within U.S. and Europe are still relatively inflated to some degree in that they have to be adjust to the present realities. We will see a contraction. Will it be 5 to 20 percent? That remains to be seen, perhaps after the U.S. elections. And uh, I talked about bonds. There's a lot of concern in terms of uh, internationally, say, U.S. Treasuries uh, that people have been buying. People feel it's a great safe haven, like the Japanese yen. But in the long term, uh, we've heard speakers in this conference speaking about yen and the role of Japanese economy. If we have debt uh, in Japan, that's 250 percent of your GDP. You have to ask yourself how safe haven yen will be in the long term. As a diversification instrument, it's in the very important and will remain so. But the internationalization of the renminbi, and I believe that in my lifetime, in maybe 15, 20 years, we will see the inclusion of uh, Indian rupiah and, and several other currencies, perhaps in an international basket. So there still are a lot of opportunities in that regard. We talked a little bit about real estate. Uh, there are still great opportunities in the US. The Chinese have been the greatest investors in the American real estate, which is, I think, something very, very positive. 
and we talked about um, uh, currencies beyond the dollar, also about euro and its challenges, which may become greater in the long run. I'm not quite sure whether we will see the collapse of euro, which is what Professor Stieglitz, who has also participated in these conferences, has been arguing for. But we will see more and more challenges. In the end, I talked a little bit about how these challenges reflect to, for um, family offices. Now, there was this wonderful novel by Thomas Mann in 1901, Buddenbrooks. He talked about a family uh, from that era. And basically the message was threefold. The first generation makes the money. The second generation is more interested in status and how they look and they like to, to use the money. And the third generation tends to waste it. Now how to avoid this is a perennial question to all family offices. But to, how to avoid it in the present circumstances where you may have more risks and, and, uh, than, than rewards. That's a bit that I addressed in the end. I talked about the US elections for instance and what we might see the kind of implications. Whatever happens, it will be more uncertain, it will be more volatile, we may see a correction after the elections. Uh, and if we see, if we don't see it in the short term, we will see it in the long term. Europe is facing, uh, after the UK Brexit, we'll see elections in France, elections in, in Italy, and in Germany next year. And all those elections will not end up with a solution that will be constructive in the long run for the pan-European integration. And then you have the issues with the Japanese monetary policy. Uh, most likely we will see more of the same, negative race and so on and so forth. With China, I tend to be a bit more optimistic than my colleagues in the U.S. in the sense that if it's a hard landing, it's not the kind of hard landing that happened in the U.S. after 2008. And China is a better position to manage its problems. However, I also have to say that although the past seven years I was uh, 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 not one of those who felt that China is in the middle of hard landing. The fact that the past two years the credit growth has been doubled, the size of uh, uh, GDP growth, real GDP growth, that is a problem. And the longer it takes to tackle it, the greater the problems will be in the long run. So you do have these great challenges uh, wherever you look, and it's harder to find the safe heavens. But I think that particularly for the family offices, uh, it's a time for reassessment reflection and also reassessment of the risks and the opportunities. The opportunities will always be there.